everybody, and we are live today with Dave Erickson. Uh, thanks for joining us, Dave. Thanks for having me on, Mike. I really appreciate it. No, this is awesome. Uh, so, Dave, you are an airline billing and scheduling coordinator for the Orlando Aviation Authority. Did I get that right? Yeah, so it's for the Greater Orlando Aviation Authority and specifically at uh, Orlando International Airport. Oh, wow. Okay. So, awesome. I guess... Well, let's talk about what was your path? Uh, you were in the Air Force, right? Yeah, 21 years, retired as a uh, senior master sergeant about a little more than four years ago. So what was your path from the Air Force to this current role? Uh, it, it kind of long and winding, but uh, so I retired at the end of 2016 and, and I was an airfield manager. So that's uh, more of a seeing you know how well taxiways and runways are maintained to make sure that uh, flight operations can uh, occur safely mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis managing uh, projects and trying to monitor project uh, improvements to the airfield obviously there's a supervisory role with uh, the people that you work with and mm -hmm. um, you know managing certain programs and things of that effect but um, there's not a whole lot of demand for what I do on the outside there is but you know it, mainly you're going to see that more at your more uh um your larger commercial airports much like mm -hmm. orlando so i before that i mean it took about a year from the time i retired to to land where i at the at the organization and mm -hmm. um you know in the meantime started going back to school and um you know just kind of had to uh pick my spots um ended up starting just before christmas of 2017 uh, is an operations coordinator. So I had to kind of go back out of my experience in earlier, my earlier Air Force days and kind of the command and control, the C2 aspect and mm -hmm. having to mention flight following and, um, you know, designating parking spots for aircraft coming in from other locations and uh, things of that nature and notif oh. making notification about flights. So I really had to, to dig deep um, in trying to translate what I did in the past to you know, getting on board with uh, the aviation authority. So if you had that Venn diagram um, of skills and knowledge and, and education, I was really kind of like on the edges of that, of that to, uh, to get, to get there. So are you the, are you the person that determines which gate back then, which gate the aircraft land, you know, pulls into when they come into the airport or is that kind of what you were doing? Uh, yeah. So uh, we, we had, you know, it's a sign beforehand, but then you have to monitor, especially the international arrivals, because they have mm -hmm. to clear through, you know, customs and border protection. Yeah. So you have to keep the passengers away from the, you know, domestic passengers, and they have to get to customs first before they're kind of released out to the, I guess, the general population, and you know, because essentially that's their entry point into the United States. Yeah. So you know, having to monitor to make sure that there are no delays, and having to contact customs if there are, or having to switch gates. Um, you know, if there's if there was some sort of uh, issues with, you know, if the jet bridge went down, you had to reassign it or make sure that planes weren't waiting for gates on the ground for on the tarmac for uh, long periods of time. And you, if you've been around an airport, you can see the, the status signs that tells you, uh, you know, aircraft is arriving at this gate on this airline. We update those. Um, oh, wow. If you're at the gate waiting for your flight and it tells you where it's going, uh, we update that information. So the times and everything. So um, disseminating weather information and things of that nature. So it's kind of the nerve center of uh, terminal ops. I mean, it sounds like it's a great way to kind of get your foot in the door um, and, and, and really figure out where you want to go with your career from there because you're kind of touching everything, right? <laughs> oh, you, you do because you're, you're talking to so many different agencies at the airport and the airport, if you're a large airport is really just a small city. So, mm -hmm. you know, you're talking to people in, in maintenance you're talking to people that do landside operations. You're talking to people that, you know, commercial properties and marketing and, you know, things of that nature. So uh, your name is getting thrown around quite a bit. Yeah. I, I just realized too that um, Orlando's Disney. So everybody that goes to Disney flies into Orlando. So you got all the kids running around and everybody wants to get where they're going. And ooh, wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. Obviously, that's what people think about in Orlando or, you know, theme parks. Yeah, but, you know, we have we have trade shows, we have, uh, you know, conventions, uh, we have uh, a major university, mm -hmm. Universal Central Florida is in, you know, is in in Orlando, we have sports teams. Mm -hmm. um, 
So uh, a bit of everything. We had the space launch, uh, you know, just up the road from me. Yeah. So uh, we have a lot going on. And, and Orlando is the, at least before the pandemic, was the busiest airport in the state of Florida and the 10th busiest in the country. Oh, wow. When it came to passenger traffic. So, yeah. yeah. I didn't realize it was that big, but that makes a lot of sense. Now you hit on a you hit on an interesting point earlier when you said you ra basically ran maintenance operations for the airfield. Uh, was your was your last job right? So, um, in a way, it was. It was really having to you know check runways and taxiways and seeing if there are any issues, and then having to contact engineers to go out and fix or. You know, you're having to, you know, kind of plan for the future if there's a major project that you know has to come up. If you're looking at, you know, if you know the runway has to get repainted or if there's an issue with pavement and so a section has to be uh, redone. So, you know, putting in work orders and then having to essentially lobby for funds and to get that project kind of up the list when it came to what was on the basis priority to get done, you know, competing against people that said, hey, the gym needed to get redone or, you know, another building when it came to, you know, how to basically keep the base up and running. So that was especially as, you know, the senior NCO days, that that's a lot of what I had to do. Yeah, no, I see that. But I think what was important that I, aside from that, is that you kind of said there's only so many of those jobs out there in the private sector. I mean, and the ones that do have them are at major airports. And I'm assuming that they want the person that's filling those jobs to have experience experience working in commercial airports. Would that be a fair assumption? It is fair. Um, you know, they, they certainly want a pretty fair amount of education with that as well. Mm. Um, you know, because I had the title airfield manager, but if you take a look at airport manager, mm -hmm. you know, again, and you, you've talked about this before, you know, that doesn't translate the same way. Um, mm -hmm. they're going to want, you know, um, in some cases they want certifications, yeah. certain, you know, industry certifications. And that's almost, a, a, um, yeah, there's an organization called the Air American Association of Airport Executives or mm -hmm. AAAE. And there's a few, uh, you know, sought after certifications they look for there. Either they're required is basically a go or no go thing, or they're, you know, one of those, uh, definitely a preferred um, mm -hmm. qualification or a certification they want to see on, on somebody who's applying. But a lot of the folks that do, uh, that do that, they have, you know, airline, some airline experience. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of things that is very difficult to replicate if you're yeah. looking to do this on the outside. And I could, I could see the difference between a, you know, military airfield and a commercial airport when um, it comes to everything involved. Um, yeah, I could see that a huge difference. So, so you had, you know, you came out as an airfield manager, uh, wanted to, did, I'm assuming you looked at when you came out, you wanted to do something pretty darn close, uh, for commercial airports. And then it just, you realized how long did it take you to realize it wasn't quite the same? Um, it was probably, I mean, I had an, a general idea before I retired, but, <clears throat> uh, it was, uh, to be honest, a lot more difficult than I expected. Um, mm -hmm. You know, first off, again, the opportunities just aren't as as plentiful mm -hmm. as a lot of other uh, professions are. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, you, I really had to, you know, pick my spot I'd, and again, kind of delve into some of my experiences, you know, earlier in my career or, you know, some other um, mm -hmm you know, responsibilities that I had to, to really kind of sell myself to say, okay, I can do this. But when I got in, um, I, I, there was still plenty to learn because the people that I was, I was working with, they all worked for an airline or they worked for a ground handler that had to deal with a, mm -hmm. a, an airline. So I was one of the few, you know, matter of fact, there was another person at the time who worked at an airport and had a similar job as me in Illinois. Um, kind of in the same boat as me, he didn't have airline experience, but he was able to get on and, 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 you know, he worked with me for, for a bit. He was able to do something else at the airport as well. Right. But, um, you know, it, it, it was, it, it was certainly, it took some work to be able to translate what I did into, into something actionable. And they can say, okay, this is certainly a relatable experience. Right. And you don't, you know, 
you don't stumble into senior master sergeant in the Air Force. Like it's not like you just luck into it. So to have to kind of reset, I could see would be a challenge. So how did you how did you get the job? Like how did you get? Was it you just apply online? Did you have mentors? Did you have somebody recommend it? I I, I was able to talk to a few mentors um, beforehand, but I can I'll be blunt. Mm -hmm. um, I'm one of those success stories that you talk about that this, it doesn't happen all that often. I was, mm -hmm. you know, essentially like what a two, two, three, four percent guy. Mm -hmm. um, I found the position. I applied for it. Obviously, you know, I, I looked at the description and really had to match the keywords and the, and the, and the phrases and, mm -hmm. and everything else. And, you know, what do you know? Um, went in for like kind of a, a skills test, interviewed ended up getting the position, you know, and the rest is history. But I, a lot of other folks that uh, I worked with, again, they worked at the airport in some yeah. other fashion, you know, so they, they knew people. So their, their path wasn't as uh, difficult. So, yeah. uh, but, you know, reaching out to some mentors and kind of getting an idea of, uh, you know, what to say and, and, you know, some, some general advice on kind of what the, you know, what, what words to substitute for others, you know, that yeah. certainly helped, but I was, I was lucky. I'll be honest. I was, I, I was lucky. Would you say that, I mean, was the, the first role at the airport, was that an entry or a junior level role, a mid-level role, a senior role? You know, like, I, I would say it's kind of an entry to a junior level role. Yep. So, you know, you would argue that maybe, you know, you, you probably looked highly qualified on your resume if you tailored it and everything else like that. And if someone was lucky enough to see it, they were like, holy crap, let's hire this. Let's We're going to get a senior master sergeant from the Air Force to come do this job. Heck yeah. Um, would you think that's a fair assessment? I, or I would I would probably say it's fair. And in, in actuality, um, the assistant director of my department, he was here when I first started. He was he was an Army veteran. He <laughs> uh I think he was a medic, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Um, did some time in the army. I had no idea until recently that was the case. And him and I were talking about, you know, this kind of jabbing at each other, army air force stuff, you know, um, I do tend to think that may have been a factor. I mean, obviously there is a veteran's preference where I work, so that helped, yep. but to what extent, I don't know. I, I don't, it certainly, I don't think it was an over the top type of thing. Obviously I did something right in the testing and obviously yeah. I did something right in the interview. Um, you know, during my research on the airport and, you know, some things that had happened, I think that helped obviously, but um, uh, it would be safe to say, I think some aspect of it had to do with it. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just, I, I always think that there's some part of that, right. There's some reason that makes us stand out in that first job uh, when we get them and it's more likely to happen at those junior level jobs. When some, you get somebody that understands it, and says like literally like what well, we can get a senior master sergeant from the air force in here uh at this type of role for a year or two to get them a running start heck yeah like it's to me it's it's a win-win so and so you did that job for how long um i was in that position for a little under a year it was i got in it was a part-time position and then i was able oh. to get a i was able to get a full-time oh. spot now fortunately i mean i was working you know, 32, 36 hours a week. It was yeah. just one of those things where they, they needed the coverage. And then obviously one of those things and um, volunteering for extra hours, if they came up, never a bad thing. If I can give some advice, if you're in that position, if you're offered hours or to do some things and if you can do it, do it. Yeah. You know, to kind of, again, kind of set yourself apart from, from other folks. Uh, at that point I went into baggage handling systems operations. So oh. that is monitoring so, you know, you go and check in at the airport, right? And you got, you know, you check in a bag. If you're able to check in a bag anymore, it's not free unless you fly Southwest. But so, you, you know, you, unless you have status. <laughs> if you have status, you're golden. I, I, right. I, I yeah. fly a lot, so I have status. So, you know, if you check in and you see your bag go on that belt and it goes behind that curtain, we monitored all the belts beyond that point. And so, you know, having to. <laughs> you know, deal with jams. And then if there's a major problem in the system, having to, you know, get people up to move to different ticket counters, if things were, you know, very, you know, uh, 
very fascinating job. A lot of work. You had to definitely think on your feet. And, mm -hmm. um, and again, you're, you're, if there's something majorly wrong with the, anything in the operation, you were having to send out, you know, mass emails. And so again, your name is getting out there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm so, can I tell I'm so intrigued by this stuff. I, I always <laughs> carry these guards on here. Uh, he used to take pictures uh, and share like, like action photos inside ball metal packs factory. We make all this steel cans and all that. And I just love looking at the machinery and talking to you now and thinking about everything that goes on behind the scenes in an airport from the data that goes up on the boards I'm looking at to where the planes park to now I know who's responsible for that one time I sat on the tarmac, you know, for 45 minutes, not you, but somebody in your <laughs> position. Uh, and then, and then you talk about the baggage handling, you like, like, where does it go when we hand it to the people and, and you see it just go down and then just go behind that screen and then it shows up in your next airport or not. Uh, more often than not, it does. Because uh, yeah. I have status and they put that thing on there and the airports take care of you. Like I'm so, ah, we got to do another session. I Or, you know, someday talk about like maybe a behind the scenes look at the airport. But um, so you did that. You did baggage handling again, uh, going above and beyond standing out people get to know your name right you become a hot commodity because you make things happen yeah and and you know again this is something that's been talked about in different forums on linkedin and you've mentioned it as well but uh the the whole thing with once you're in an organization mm -hmm. internal hiring is a is a big thing they like to do that mm -hmm. so i guess again once you're in something your you know your mobility is uh um you know definitely not limited so oh. Yeah, I mean, you have to, you have, to, if you have high performers and you don't take care of them, they leave, right? So it sounds like you were going above and beyond. You got your foot in the door. You learned year one uh, in operations. Then you, they gave you another opportunity. You rocked that. How long did you do the baggage handling systems? I, I was there for another year. Okay. And uh, I've been. Was that a promotion or was it just a lateral? Was that a promotion up or was it lateral? It was more of a lateral thing, but. Okay. Again, the things that, you know, again, in, 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 in baggage handling systems, the people I work with, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. It was a good group of people yeah. to work with. Um, you know, you have a, kind of a, um, a singular mission, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, you know, basically making sure bags come, get from the ticket counter to the plane. You know, mm -hmm. that's what you have to do. And you have to make sure you do that correctly. Um, or else you're going to be hearing from station managers about missing bags and everything else. Not oh, funny. Imagine. Um, so. You know, from there, going into the billing and scheduling aspect where, again, you're just, you know, talking to numerous organizations about, you know, what's happening with airlines and their schedules and having to plan out, you know, months in advance, um, you know, still having to deal with with urgent needs if the planes are coming in at diversions for international flights and, you know, trying to, you know, plan out what airlines are going to do, especially if, you uh, you know, you have carriers that are wanting to start operations here or they're wanting to expand, uh, you know, what they're what they're doing on a daily basis. And again, making sure that there's there's space. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think we skipped a part there. So that's your current job, right? Yeah. So th is that a promotion or is that another lateral? It's a, uh, so I'm, I'm sorry, let me go back. For, so when I was in operations center to baggage handling, it was a kind of promotion up. And right. in this particular case, going from baggage handling to where I'm at now is a lateral thing. Okay, but you're uh, what I'm loving. What I, what I'm seeing, and maybe I'm just reading the future. Is now you have operations experience, you've got baggage handling experience, you've got you know scheduling and billing experience. I, have you taken that AAA exam cert yet? I mean, I well, think that's I, probably the future, right? Because it looks like you're getting yeah. a holistic, uh you know, like almost like one of these leadership courses that they build in some of these where you touch different parts and you kind of build a path for you for continued growth in the, in the airport industry. Yeah. So, um, I had been working on my bachelor's degree. I just got that done a little less than a year ago. Got it done in the spring of 2020. Thank you. Um, and that was loved it. it, it you know, loved doing the school thing. It was a lot of hard work, but, um, mm -hmm. I really enjoyed it in a way I miss it, but, was that um, glass ceiling holding you back from excelling with like was is a bachelor degree a minimum requirement for certain roles certain roles it is yeah. um and you know 
it wasn't a requirement in my in my current role, mm-hmm. but uh, it, it was one of those things that they would have preferred. Again, being an internal hire, I think that you know help you know grease the skids to to get into it. But um, <clears throat> you know, looking at it now, it's still something I'm looking at pursuing. Um, and anybody who's wanting to get in this industry or stay in it once, if they had something to do, whether it be in the army or in any branch, I would certainly look into AAA E certification opportunities. And as a military member or a veteran, you get a discount on membership and, and things like that. So, um, it's so still something I'm here. looking to pursue, but it's, yeah. it's something you definitely have to, you know, invest the time to do it because it's what they give you is no joke. You have to definitely study and, and everything else to pass the exams. That's the best kind. So that's the desired certification if you want to work in commercial airports, I'm guessing. Yeah. So a, the a, a big one and kind of a not necessarily a starting point, but one that definitely a lot of people go after is called the the certified member or the CM mm-hmm. uh, certification. And there's others. There's ones even higher up, but you're talking at you know that some of them require having a bachelor's degree or a master's degree to get. And then that's for the management piece. And then for like the repairs and maintenance, that's where the FAA ones come in, right? Uh, some of them do. Some of them do. Yeah. Um, not not a lot of them do. But, um, oh, okay. uh, you know, some of like air traffic control and things of that nature, you're going to have to have, you know, licenses to do that. So but. current job. So <laughs> airline billing and scheduling coordinator. Um, we got some of it, but can you can you kind of like dial it down for us and tell us? Sure. Uh, in, in non, uh, the only thing I know about airports is how to get through them quickly, uh, <laughs> and where I look for the lounges. So I yeah. hate to say it that way. I've, I've traveled so much; I'm a little bougie. Uh, <laughs> I like my comfort. <laughs> I like my status, uh, and, and uh, you know, I, I I never really you start to take for granted all that happens behind the scenes to get me from here to somewhere else, and and hopefully in yeah. the next months or so we can start really traveling again but so what do you what does an airline billing and schedule coordinator do right. so it, it's really a, a two-pronged thing two you know two main responsibilities one is having uh, communication with air carriers here at Orlando and getting what their submissions are for what they want to do for a season or what they want to fly Wow so they're projecting in international work. carriers. Yep. At that point, it is going, you know, in advance months down the line and based off of that schedule, plotting uh, where where these flights are going to go, are going to. Now, obviously, domestic flights is a little bit easier to do because they can pretty much go anywhere. International flights is a different story. Again, um, if they're you know coming in from specific locations, the UK, Brazil, Mexico, so on and so forth, they have to go to certain gates. Um, you also have to you have to be uh, cognizant of what aircraft are coming in. So your large aircraft can only oh. go to certain gates because of the size. Yeah. Um, so how, how, I, many, how many flights a day pre-COVID? Oh, uh, easily when it came to internationals, you know, you're talking about forty or fifty international flights. That's just internationals. Now, what about domestic? Oh, it, it's in the hundreds. Um, so you're, you're having to plan out you know, three, four, five, six, seven hundred 700 flights a day for an entire season in advance. Yeah. Woo. yeah. How many people? Uh, how what many people? Work? How many people working on that plan, that schedule? Uh, so it's myself. I have five other, you know, essentially uh, colleagues, uh, yeah. uh, peers. Mm-hmm. And then I have uh, kind of an assistant man. We have an assistant manager and a, and a supervisor as well. So in total, eight. Um, and then, you know, the other aspect of it is then we have to deal with customs and border protection. So whenever we get these, get these international schedules, and then we have to coordinate with customs to submit the schedule that that airline wants to do. And then making sure that the, (laughs) the customs can, um, you know, accommodate that, those particular flights. So if it's within their operating hours and stuff like that, I'm Um, still stuck on, you know, planning out 50,000 flights in advance by like what tool do you, do you have like a Microsoft project? Do you have a special tool you do to that? I'm sorry. I got to, I got to, no. the numbers are blowing me away here. So 
Um, we have we have different programs from different companies, and yeah. one is a, a essentially like a resource management system, yeah. right? It's and so it, it plots yeah. out. So it's a Gantt chart, you know. Yeah. So you're on the right path. You're talking about Microsoft projects, yeah. But it's a Gantt chart that it has, you know, each air side, and then you know what gate is which. So gate one, three, yeah. whatever. And you know, so each flight is like a block where mm -hmm. they call it a puck. It's like a yeah. it's like a strip, and it tells you what plane it is, what flight coming in, what flight going out, where it's coming from, where it's going to, and then you have to plot that, you know, um, you know, at, at a particular gate. And again, you're still having to deal with the carries because they yeah. like to. They each of them kind of have like their own little sandbox that they like to play in. So yeah. You know, Delta likes to be here and Southwest likes to be here and Spirit yeah. likes to be here and JetBlue, so on and so forth. And so then do, you have the, do you have a lot of oh crap moments like when flights are delayed or you have to figure out where they're going to go because they just messed up your schedule or, you know, flights are canceled and like so, how does that all impact your schedule? Is that like a daily basis just deconflicting all of that as well? Well, part of it is on a daily basis, but, you know, we have to take a look, you know, like a, we have like a seven day window that we take a look at and we look, you know, to make sure everything's kind of gated properly from like the next day until like, you know, again, seven days out mm -hmm. the day of operations that is dealing that that is the operations center's responsibility at that point. Okay. Everything really happens day of that's not in our hands. We're looking, we're looking at the future, right? Um, not so much the day of, although yeah. If things come up the day of, a lot of times we're still having to coordinate with them um, if, you know, stuff hits the fan, so yep. to speak. Yeah. Um, and again, the other aspect of it is the, is billing. Yeah. So um, I, was get to that thing. Uh, I like it. So, uh, again, another aspect that's very different from military when it comes to, you know, airfields and airports. You have to remember that commercial airports are they, they need to make money. They have to make revenue. Um, <laughs> You're not doing it for free. No. <laughs> You know, so again, in the military, you know, you, you have to deal with money, right? But it's all about managing it correctly and being a good steward of government money. But, you know, airports are money making entities. Mm -hmm. So anytime you see an airplane land on a runway, you can just think of a little cash register going off. There's landing fees. Anytime an aircraft parks at a gate, um, that's, sound that's money. Like I want to hear. <laughs> Sorry, I can't. I can't do the sound effect. Yeah, no. Um, but, uh, you know, you park at it. You. What air what what airport do you fly out of typically? Uh, I typically fly out of Dulles. All right. So do you park? Where do you park? Do you park like? Yeah, I park in the little because uh, I can write it all off. I park right in the in the on. Oh, that's nice. The the the, the one right next to the airport. <laughs> okay. So you park. That's money the airport gets. Yeah. You yeah. rent a car. You rent a car on airport property. There's part of the concession, like the you know, take a look at your bill. And it says like, you know, airport can set that goes back to the airport can, you know, clear. You know I use yeah, clear. The, yeah there, there's part of it there, you know, so if you buy, you know, if you, if you buy a coffee at Starbucks, you know, yeah. um, uh, if you buy, you know, if you had to get a piece of luggage at one of the stores, um, mm -hmm. you know, part of that goes back to the airport, you know, you know, you're talking about all of that billing, like you handle a lot of the billing for the whole airport or just the, um, no, sorry, let me kind of shrink it again. Um, yeah. I'm taking, we're taking a look at it from an aspect of just strictly, you know, um, operational, mm -hmm. you know, just operational purposes. So landings where they park, if they use gates, how long they use gates, mm -hmm. um, what ticket counters, how much ticket counter space they use, what bag claims they use. Um, you well, know, so you think about it. Well, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. I, I'm, I'm going down a hole again, but they have to pay for how long they're at, at the gate. And yep. they have to pay for the number of ticket counters they use. Yep. And they, oh my God. Well, each each airport is going to be different. Each airport has a different business model. <laughs> and you th here, I guess the way to explain it where I'm at is every every bit of what kind of what you see is real estate. Uh huh. You know, so certain airlines lease like you know on a on a yearly basis. So your bigger carriers, they they say, okay, yep. well, they have an agreement to you know, be able to use up to X amount of gates or X amount of ticket counter space and X amount of bag claims and other carriers that don't come in as often. It's kind of like basically, you know, case by case or whenever they, they use like it. So, yeah. 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 Um, and, you know, so for a certain aircraft, if it's a, you know, a 737, they have, you know, say two hours to turn the plane or mm -hmm. if it's a 
if it's a larger aircraft, they have a bit more time. So, um, you know, we're taking a look at to make sure that they are getting build properly. So if we see mistakes, if they used an additional gate or if they were stuck, if they're at a gate for a longer amount of time, obviously they, they need to, you know, they have to get build more. Or in some cases, we have to make sure that they're not getting build improperly either. So we don't obviously want to be, you know, good to the carriers as well if they're not, if they're not using, um, you know, certain aspects or not using, or if they're using something and it's not getting, um, you know, price properly you know one one mistake that we found out the way to think about it is the 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 amount of money that we ended up seeing that an airline had to be get billed was like you know really like one person's salary yeah uh, so i am uh when you told me we could talk about this for a couple hours um at first i was skeptical uh <laughs> uh now i see like i'm i'm totally intrigued so um, I know we're already somehow over 30 minutes. That's crazy. I, I guess what I would ask, I, uh, I got a couple questions for you. Um, what in your military background do you think has made you, has translated the most and made you the most successful where you're at now? Uh, so uh, I would I'll say uh, one of the hard skills, so to speak, oddly enough, this may sound crazy, but mm -hmm. It is knowing, knowing some nomenclature about aircraft types. Um, oh. So uh, the terms, we use terms like wide body and narrow body aircraft. Mm -hmm. So narrow body aircraft being your 737s and Airbus A320s and wide body aircraft being, say, 747s and yeah. Airbus A330. So um, that that's a big piece of it. And understanding that... Um, you know, obviously larger aircraft require more space and, and knowing that, you know, at certain locations, at least where I'm at, if you have an aircraft parked at one gate, then how another gate or another jet bridge is able to operate because mm -hmm. of that big airplane, you may not be able to use another gate. So right. that's one one thing that we have to use quite a bit when but it comes to from your Air Force time. Oh, so you had to figure all that out during your Air Force time as well. A lot of it, yeah. Or because again, we're not again in the Air Force. You're not using gates per se, yeah. but again, if you're having to figure out what aircraft can can go at certain locations and knowing what restrictions there are, um, that that was something you know being able to translate that helped out a little right. bit. So having having the experience, maybe not the exact words on occasion, but the experience. Uh, working with airfields and managing where aircraft go and everything else like that. And having grown it throughout your career probably gave you a really strong foundation. Yes. And then I, I was in a position, I was fortunate enough, um, one of my jobs, uh, I would say two of my jobs, I had one position where I was kind of in operational planning for uh, a major command in the Air Force, you mm -hmm. know, so kind of like a, uh, an airfield operations person that was doing things for the European command and African command. And, you know, if there was something happening someplace and having to do research on on airfields all over the place and having an idea. It's like, OK, you can fit X amount of these aircraft here, you know, perfect world situation. And so doing that type of planning, I think, helped as well. So having a job, um, being yeah. in, a, in a position certainly helped. And then obviously the typical soft skills, being able to work in a team environment, communicating effectively is a big deal. Yeah. Um, we we also rely on emails and i do remember in the military um you know having proper email etiquette it's a big deal um it, i think that's only the air force. Community. <laughs> i think that's only the air force that uses proper uh email etiquette i don't remember that <laughs> in the army anywhere i hate to say it that way uh but in the army i remember senior leaders saying like if it's more than two sentences i'm not reading it like i i've actually had some some say that uh but i i think i guess um, I see what you're saying. Like being professional in your communication, uh, it is so important, right? Yes. Um, and again, uh, no, you know, again, kind of knowing your audience, um, you know, because these things are going out to a lot of times in, in my position or, you know, something that you may have to ask, uh, your supervisors, like I'm sending this stuff out as a notification, but who is it going out to? Who right. sees it? And if they say, okay, it's going to be all the way up to CEO level. Yeah. You, you better adjust and make sure um, that it's, 
you know, you have all your information there and it, it sounds, yep. you know, it sounds right. Yep. That's definitely an air force thing. And I say that in the best ways. So <laughs> where they, I didn't learn that. I mean, I guess I learned it from, from banging my head into it a few times in the army, but I hear you. So, um, uh, and, and part of knowing the audience uh, also is knowing that I've got to wrap this this up. Um, but what I would say is, uh, I guess the final question is, if anyone's interested in, in working around airports uh, and they're a transitioning service member or a veteran or a military spouse, do you have any problem with them reaching out direct to you on LinkedIn? No, uh, not at all. Um, I'll do my best, obviously, to uh, get in contact with anybody who has a question as quick as I possibly can. So I have no problem with that. Not at all. Awesome. Well, Dave, thank you so much for uh, spending this, uh, you know, close to 40 minutes with us uh, in your afternoon and on your day off, I believe. Right. Uh, yeah. And, and so thank you for giving back and uh, I appreciate you. Let me know if you need anything. Appreciate it, Mike. Again, thanks for having me on. I really enjoyed it. Absolutely. I did as well. We'll do it again sometime. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye.